Section 10 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 10. The Torture by Hope, by Vierre de Lille Adem. Many years ago, as evening was closing in, the venerable Pedro Arbuez de Espala, sixth prior of the Dominicans of Segovia, and third grand inquisitor of Spain, followed by a fra redemptor, and preceded by two familiars of the holy office, the latter carrying lanterns, made their way to a subterranean dungeon. The bolt of a massive door creaked, and they entered a mephitic in pace, where the dim light revealed between rings fastened to the wall a blood-stained rack, a brazier, and a jug. On a pile of straw, loaded with fetters, and his neck encircled by an iron carcan, sat a haggard man, of uncertain age, clothed in rags. This prisoner was no other than Rabbi Azer Abarbanel, a Jew of Aragon, who, accused of usury and pitiless scorn for the poor, had been daily subjected to torture for more than a year. Yet his blindness was as dense as his hide, and he had refused to abjure his faith. Proud of affiliation dating back thousands of years, proud of his ancestors, for all Jews worthy of the name are vain of their blood, he descended Talmudically from Athoniel, and, consequently, from Ipsabah, the wife of the last judge of Israel, a circumstance which had sustained his courage amid incessant torture. With tears in his eyes, at the thought of this resolute soul rejecting salvation, the venerable Pedro Arbuez de Espila, approaching the shuddering rabbi, addressed him as follows. My son, rejoice! Your trials here below are about to end. If in the presence of such obstinacy I was forced to permit, with deep regret, the use of great severity, my task of fraternal correction has its limits. You are the fig-tree, which, having failed so many times to bear fruit, at last withered, but God alone can judge your soul. Perhaps infinite mercy will shine upon you at the last moment. We must hope so. There are examples. So sleep in peace to-night. To-morrow you will be included in the auto de fe, that is, you will be exposed to the K. Madero, the symbolical flames of the everlasting fire. It burns, as you know, only at a distance, my son, and death is at least two hours, often three, in coming, on account of the wet, iced bandages with which we protect the heads and hearts of the condemned. There will be forty-three of you. Placed in the last row, you will have time to invoke God, and offer to Him this baptism of fire, which is of the Holy Spirit. Hope in the light, and rest. With these words, having signed to his companions to unchain the prisoner, the prior tenderly embraced him. Then came the turn of the Fra Redemptor, who, in a low tone, entreated the Jew's forgiveness for what he had made him suffer for the purpose of redeeming him. Then the two familiars silently kissed him. This ceremony over, the captive was left, solitary and bewildered, in the darkness. Rabbi Acer Abarbanel, with parched lips and visage worn by suffering, at first gazed at the closed door with vacant eyes. Closed? The word unconsciously roused a vague fancy in his mind, the fancy that he had seen for an instant the light of the lanterns through a chink between the door and the wall. A morbid idea of hope, due to the weakness of his brain, stirred his whole being. He dragged himself towards the strange appearance. Then, very gently and cautiously, slipped one finger into the crevice. He drew the door toward him. Marvelous! By an extraordinary accident, the familiar who closed it 
had turned the huge key an instant before it struck the stone casing, so that the rusty bolt, not having entered the hole, the door again rolled on its hinges. The rabbi ventured to glance outside. By the aid of a sort of luminous dusk, he distinguished at first a semicircle of walls, indented by winding stairs, and, opposite to him, at the top of five or six stone steps, a sort of black portal, opening into an immense corridor, whose first arches only were visible from below. Stretching himself flat, he crept to the threshold. Yes, it was really a corridor, but endless in length. A wan light illumined it, lamp suspended from the vaulted ceiling, lightened at intervals the dull hue of the atmosphere. The distance was veiled in shadow. Not a single door appeared in the whole extent. Only on one side, the left, heavily grated loopholes, sunk in the walls, admitted a light which must be that of evening, for crimson bars, at intervals, rested on the flags of the pavement. What a terrible silence! Yet, yonder, at the far end of that passage, there might be a doorway of escape. The Jew's vacillating hope was tenacious, for it was the last. Without hesitating, he ventured on the flags, keeping close under the loopholes, trying to make himself part of the blackness of the long walls. He advanced slowly, dragging himself along on his breast, forcing back the cry of pain when some raw wound sent a keen pang through his whole body. Suddenly the sound of a sandaled foot, approaching, reached his ears. He trembled violently. Fear stifled him. His sight grew dim. Well... It was over, no doubt. He pressed himself into a niche, and, half lifeless with terror, waited. It was a familiar hurrying along. He passed swiftly by, holding in his clenched hand an instrument of torture, a frightful figure, and vanished. The suspense which the rabbi had endured seemed to have suspended the functions of life, and he lay nearly an hour unable to move. Fearing an increase of tortures if he were captured, he thought of returning to his dungeon. But the old hope whispered in his soul that divine, perhaps, which comforts us in our sorest trials. A miracle had happened. He could doubt no longer. He began to crawl toward the chance of escape. Exhausted by suffering and hunger, trembling with pain, he pressed onward. The sepulchral corridor seemed to lengthen mysteriously, while he, still advancing, gazed into the gloom where there must be some avenue of escape. Oh, oh, he again heard footsteps, but this time they were slower, more heavy. The white and black forms of two inquisitors appeared, emerging from the obscurity beyond. They were conversing in low tones, and seemed to be discussing some important subject, for they were gesticulating vehemently. At this spectacle, Rabbi Acer Abarbanel closed his eyes. His heart beat so violently that it almost suffocated him. His rags were damp with the cold sweat of agony. He lay motionless by the wall, his mouth wide open, under the rays of a lamp, praying to the God of David. Just opposite to him, the two inquisitors paused under the light of the lamp, doubtless owing to some accident due to the course of their arguments. One, while listening to his companion, gazed at the rabbi, and beneath the look, whose absence of expression the hapless man did not at first notice, he fancied he again felt the burning pincers scorch his flesh. He was to be once more a living wound." Fainting, breathless, with fluttering eyelids, he shivered at the touch of the monk's floating robe. But, strange yet natural fact, the inquisitor's gaze was evidently that of a man deeply absorbed in his intended reply, engrossed by what he was hearing. His eyes were fixed, and seemed to look at the Jew without seeing him. In fact, after the lapse of a few minutes— the two gloomy figures, 
slowly pursued their way, still conversing in low tones, toward the place whence the prisoner had come. He had not been seen. Amid the horrible confusion of the rabbi's thoughts, the idea darted through his brain. Can I be already dead that they did not see me? A hideous impression roused him from his lethargy. In looking at the wall, against which his face was pressed, he imagined he beheld two fierce eyes watching him. He flung his hand back in a sudden frenzy of fright, his hair fairly bristling. Yet, no, no. His hand groped over the stones. It was the reflection of the Inquisitor's eyes, still retained in his own, which had been refracted from two spots on the wall. Forward! He must hasten toward that goal which he fancied, absurdly, no doubt, to be deliverance, toward the darkness from which he was now barely thirty paces distant. He pressed forward, faster on his knees, his hands, at full length, dragging himself painfully along, and soon entered the dark portion of this terrible corridor. Suddenly the poor wretch felt a gust of cold air on the hands resting upon the flags. It came from under the little door to which the two walls led. Oh, heaven, if that door should open outward! Every nerve in the miserable fugitive's body thrilled with hope. He examined it from top to bottom, though scarcely able to distinguish its outlines in the surrounding darkness. He passed his hand over it. No bolt, no lock. A latch. He started up. The latch yielded to the pressure of his thumb. The door silently swung open before him. Hallelujah! murmured the rabbi in a transport of gratitude as, standing on the threshold, he beheld the scene before him. The door had opened into the gardens, above which arched a starlit sky, into spring, liberty, life. It revealed the neighboring fields, stretching toward the Sierras, whose sinuous blue lines were relieved against the horizon. Yonder lay freedom. Oh, to escape! He would journey all night through the lemon groves, whose fragrance reached him. Once in the mountains, and he was safe. He inhaled the delicious air. The breeze revived him. His lungs expanded. He felt in his swelling heart the veni foras of Lazarus. And, to thank once more the God who had bestowed this mercy upon him, he extended his arms, raising his eyes toward heaven. It was an ecstasy of joy. Then he fancied he saw the shadow of his arms approach him, fancied that he felt these shadowy arms enclose, embrace him, and that he was pressed tenderly to someone's breast. A tall figure actually did stand directly before him. He lowered his eyes, and remained motionless, gasping for breath, dazed, with fixed eyes, fairly driveling with terror. Horror! He was in the clasp of the Grand Inquisitor himself, the venerable Pedro Arbuez de Espila, who gazed at him with tearful eyes, like a good shepherd who had found his stray lamb. The dark-robed priest pressed the hapless Jew to his heart with so fervent an outburst of love that the edges of the monocle haircloth rubbed the Dominican's breast. And while Acer Arbabiniel, with protruding eyes, gasped in agony in the ascetic's embrace, vaguely comprehending that all the phases of this fatal evening were only a prearranged torture, that of hope, the Grand Inquisitor, with an accent of touching reproach and a look of consternation, murmured in his ear, his breath parched and burning from long fasting, "'What, my son, on the eve, perchance, of salvation, you wished to leave us?' End of section 10 Recording by Katie Riley September 2009